morning, my friends. <laughs> I'm happy. I am burnt out and wore out, but I don't know. I just, coming to church energizes me. The singing, the prayers, the music, it all has an effect on me. And I know as you as well. It's why God set up a church in the first place. And we come to these kind of events, and we come usually drained from the week, and we find God's peace. Now, I want to pray before we get started, especially so since we've been in the book of Zechariah. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the spirit that connects heart to heart. Now may you connect us to your heart. And open our eyes that we would let the text speak and say what you wish and will it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Zechariah is not one of these books that you can just kind of throw stuff together. So it's been tough, and it's been an adventure because every week I look at the next chapter, and I'm like, oh man, what in the world? Next week's even worse. Uh, this week, though, was a pleasant surprise. You know, in the first sermon we had on Zechariah, we really saw that the man in the myrtle trees, there was a message that God wanted to get out to the world at a certain time in its history. And we evaluated that and looked and seen how that fit perfectly with the rise of the remnant message and the ins and outs of that. Last week, we looked at chapter 3, that there was another message. The message that was to go out in all the world in chapters 1 and 2 was found in chapter 3, the judgment hour message of God. That God had a world that found itself under condemnation. He had a, a heavenly high priest to fight the adversary, to bring about a true and real lasting righteousness in Christ that would be given to us through repentance, through faith. And we saw that that was the message that God needed the world to get. And as I looked in chapter 4 for today's lecture... I surely saw exactly what I would expect to see. If Zechariah is falling, fo following the everlasting gospel of Revelation chapter 14, especially when we get to uh, chapter um, 6 and 7 and 8 and 9, we get into those places. If we're following that all out, Zechariah is going right down where we're supposed to be. What's supposed to follow next after we've had the righteousness of Christ imputed to us? After we've been justified by faith, you already know where the gospel is taking you. And so surely Zechariah chapter 4 is taking us right there where it's supposed to. Today we're going to introduce a new char character. His name is Zerubbabel. He's the primary character of Zechariah chapter 4. His name means, <laughs> and rightly so, one that was sown in Babylon or one that was born in Babylon. It's interesting how that's going to be a theme in some of the next upcoming chapters. But I, as we start, I want you to think about that idea of what it must have been like for Zerubbabel to have been born in Babylon. And now he's being faced with, tasked with an entire work that in some ways is foreign to him. He's about to be tasked with the chief man that's in charge of raising up the second temple and reinstituting all of the commandments and laws and statutes and sacrifices in ways of God's people, their mission and mandate to the world. He is about to be tasked with not only raising up the literal second temple, but setting a a picture, a paradigm for the heavenly temple that would be raised up post-1844. The attention of the world being drawn to there. He has a great big job, but the problem is that he was born in Babylon. And that means that his mind in some ways, maybe even in innocent ways, ways that he can't help, his mind has been influenced with Babylonian ways and Babylonian thoughts. And God is going to have to show him something that he's not used to looking at with his Babylonian mind. And I thought as we think about how this chapter is couched, it wants us to, to also take the same kind of idea that we all, in some ways, have been born in Babylon. All of us have learned to traffic in Western American ways in thinking processes. 
We've learned from the time that we were children to think in a certain way. And that way is not necessarily evil in of itself. It's not sinful in, a, in its application, but it is a problem when God has called us to be Zerubbabel's in our time. When God has tasked us with a certain work, to have Babylonian mindsets are going to be difficult to overcome. And so the chapter is dedicated to those that need to learn a new way of thinking so that God can perform His good work in your personal lives but also in the greater picture, the message that he wants to get out into the world. And so while we were born in Babylon, the book of Zechariah is about an awakened man, a man that came to an awakening, a man that came to an understanding, and God is trying to help him see how he's going to accomplish this task. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1, he says, now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. It's almost automatically, since we know that Zechariah is an end time book, we can connect it to other places like Haggai and Revelation. But if we're talking about New Testament, old uh, New Testament end time event kind of parables that are especially connected with the Advent movement, one would have to immediately consider the parable that Jesus told about a group of people that were asleep. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 7, it was considered to be one of the great Adventist battle cries that developed out of the 1840s. Matthew chapter 25 is a parable of the ten virgins. And it was also became known in the 1840s as the midnight cry. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 7, I, I don't want to, to read the whole thing, but it was simply the parable of ten virgins. It was a picture of the sleeping Christian world. It was a picture really of the sleeping Christian church that had, had all believed in Christ, but they all fell asleep. And when they woke up, all of them woke up and heard that the bridegroom comes. And five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. The five that were wise, we'll look at why they were wise later on. But the five that were wise rose up and they were able to go in with their Lord and proclaim the message. This message of a sleeping church was the midnight cry. It awakened the church. It, the church is, really, in the 1840s. There was this message that went out. It's the first angel's message. It's the message of Zechariah chapter 3 that we looked at last week. It's the message of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. It was a message that goes to a sleeping world to wake up because the bridegroom is here. And Zechariah says, I had a dream and I was like a man that was awakened out of his sleep. We know that this is connected to the end time movement because it's a quote right out of Daniel chapter 8, verse 18. Daniel 8, verse 18, if you're familiar with Daniel chapter 8, it is that chapter that talks about the coming of the hour of God's judgment. Daniel 8, verse 14 is the, the famous statement in this denomination, for unto 2,300 years, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And if we read a little bit further down from that statement, you get where Zechariah is quoting from. Daniel chapter 8, verse 18, when he says this, he says, Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and he stood upright. And so the only other place that we find that a man in a deep sleep that's awakened and has a message that's like one that's awakened is in Zechariah chapter 4. So here are the connections. We talked about the book of Zechariah is filled for these co of these connections to orientate you towards what the book is talking about. The chapter is speaking about this message that needs to go forward in all of the earth, but his people were asleep. They were born in Babylon and Babylon always has a lullaby for the people of God. But there is an awakening that the book of Zechariah talks about. I have known, Mary found this out terribly so, about our first year, six months into our marriage of our first year, that I have terrible night terrors. 
I can wake up in the middle of the night screaming like a crazy man, jumping out of my bed, and she'll be trying to wake me up. And when I wake up, I'm stuck somewhere in between the dream and reality. I don't quite know where I'm at for a good 15 or 20 seconds. I'm like in a, in a stupor. It's the picture that Zechariah is trying to paint. That I was like a man that, that woke up and trying to figure out what am I looking at. Because part of him is in Babylon, but God is showing him in this, in this state, this vision, something new to look at. And he's trying to grasp and discern what is real and what is not, where he is, where he's not. Men like Zechariah, men like Daniel are having an awakening the women in the parable of the virgins, five of them, they're all actually, all ten of them are awakening, but some are going to discern what's real and what's not. And that is our message today. In a sense, as a God's people, we've got to discern what's real and what's not. What part of our life has been an entire dream and what part is actually reality? My daddy used to say this all the time, that our lives are one great grand illusion. None of it's actually real. I mean, it's real in a biological sense, in an earthly sense, but it's all slated for ashes. It's all temporary. Everything that we can achieve and do and have and buy and build in this world is really an illusion. It's temporary. You cannot hang on to it. Your youth, your life, your vitality, your money, your looks, it's all headed south. But Zechariah has got to figure out what is real, and so does God's people. What is absolute real and what is true? We've got to wake up out of the nightmare of Babylon. Get out of this mindset that we've been in our whole lives, and we're starting to see that there is a, oh, well, another reality, another mindset that God wants me to lay hold of. Now, when Zechariah was waking up, what was he wakened up to? If you really want to know what God was telling Zechariah to go do, or I'm sorry, not Zechariah, but Zerubbabel to go do through Zechariah, we just have to flip back to the book of Nehemiah because they're connected. Zechariah is the prophetic portions of those books, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah. They're all around the second temple period. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11 through 17, is a picture of the reality that God was calling Zerubbabel to go do something about. And I use this in my Wheel of Faith seminar a lot, but it's such a great picture. Verses 11 through 17, this is what God was going to call Zerubbabel to go repair. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate. And viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate in the king's pool. But there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. Verse 17, then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in. Now Jerusalem lies waste. Its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. If you know the book of Nehemiah, no one wanted to go back and rebuild because the place was a devastated mess. It's like saying I had these pictures of Houston, Texas in my life since I was a childhood. And when I came home, let's say some war had taken place, and I went down to the Houston Museum, and it was just a, a pile of rubble. And I went down to the San Jacinto Monument where the battleship of Texas was, and it was blown down to pieces. And all the beautiful places that, that reminded me of what home was was gone and destroyed. And then someone saying, hey, you're going to go back and rebuild all that. It was the most depressing, discouraging thing that God had tasked any man to do. And Zerubbabel was the man that was going to go and rebuild the entire city of Jerusalem and reinstitute all of its work and all of its services. There's no way that he is going to do that. 
with the Babylonian mindset of how. You've got to remember the people were not with him. The people did go back, but they didn't go back to rebuild the place of God. They went back and rebuilt their own homes. They were living in their paneled cedar houses. You remember we, we studied that a bit in Nehemiah and Esther. And they were going back, but they weren't going back to work for God. And, and haven't we also could, could think about that? That when we look at the things that God has tasked us as a people to do, it seems impossible. It seems like there's no way. The world's just too messed up. I tell God this all the time. I, I, don't, I don't know. I've lived old enough now to remember when Bible work used to, you could go knock on doors. We could knock on at least 10, 15 doors and get one yes. Now you knock on 100 doors. And you might get one yes. It is a difficult work out there. We're living in a world where the signs of the times are like being fulfilled in front of our faces unlike anything we've ever seen. We're living in the most incredible, difficult times. People are more turned off to the Christian faith than ever before because of the clown posse that's taking control of it. No one gives it any kind of... Serious credence or way of life. They see right through what's going on in megachurch movements. And so it colors us all with the same stroke of the brush. It is harder now to be a Christian than it ever has been before. It is harder to get in people's life than it has ever been before. People are more isolated and insular than ever before. To try to get into someone's personal life with the gospel and messing around with their very innermost personal feelings about God is nearly impossible. And don't we believe that we're in a church? And let me just be as kind as I can. <laughs> and let's just say this does it look like we're in a church that's about to fall? We could leave it there, and your mind would run wild with all kinds of thoughts that you see about things going on. I've been reading Spalding's. I tell you this almost every week because I can't put it down. Spalding's origin and history, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And as I'm reading the book, sometimes I can't. Mary's like, "What's going on?" And I'm trying to read her a quote, and I'm choking up. I can't hardly finish the chapters because that's what my church used to look like. This is the, how the people used to give. This is the kind of way they used to live. Here was the message. Here was the song of their heart. Here is the way they, the Adventist church, man, they were out in the world. They had a message that they believed in, and, and they were living it, and they went through the most incredible oppression and persecutions and problems and troubles and poverty and struggles. And when I look at that, and then I turn my eyes to my own failures as a pastor, my own failures in being part of a church. And I look and I, I'm, like, I'm like Nehemiah. I weep. Like, what has happened? I understand that we have awakened into a nightmare. Because it's dawning on some of us, maybe not most of us, that the end is very near. It cannot be far off. I'm telling you, it cannot be far off. And yet we think about all that has to be done by God's remnant church, and it seems like we're waking up into something that is impossible. But God has said to Zerubbabel in chapter 4, verse 10, a great statement. And it was the title of the sermon, For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout all the earth. What is this idea of the day of small things? What does it mean in context, at least to what we're reading? The day of small things, it's a, it's a reference to Zerubbabel's faith. Zerubbabel is challenged. He's seeing the daunting task, but... He does something interesting. God says, go and rebuild. It's an impossible task. <laughs> go and do all this work. But Zerubbabel, it says, heaven is rejoiced to see Zerubbabel pick up the, the plumb line. You know what a plumb bob is? It's one of the first things a builder uses to start building. It's the string with the metal weight, and it's where he starts marking the lines. When someone shows up with a plumb bob in their hand, they're about to go to work. They've done laid the whole thing out in their mind. They've done got a plan. They're ready to start executing. 
And so the day of small things is, is really speaking about the faith of Zerubbabel. Don't despise something that is small like this. In his mind, he had determined that he could do what God had given him to do. It was really a picture of his act of faith. Don't despise that simple idea, that simple thought. The second temple period would have to be built on faith. Because they had all kind of enemies and obstacles. When you look at Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of Esther, you will see all the enemies that God's people had. You know, Tobiah, you had the Ammonite, you had the Arabs and some other tribes, you had Philistines, you had the Persians that were trying to destroy them, you had Haman trying to wipe out Esther and Mordecai. All this was during the same time period. And Zerubbabel was going to have to build during that time period when, when no one wanted to do God's work because it was dangerous. You remember in Nehemiah, <laughs> Wayne Scheinemann has been helping me at my house this week. He cracked a joke. He said, you know, this is like Nehemiah's house. I was like, what do you mean? you gotta, you got to have a, your tool in one hand and a weapon in the other one. <laughs> But this is what was going on. It was like literally your life and your hands to be caught working on God's house. But Nehemiah was going to accomplish it by a day of small things. By a time of of faith. His little small act of faith in picking up the plumb line. That little small thing. By God telling you to do something impossible and then picking up a plumb line and going to do it. Without a clue in the world how God is going to provide, that is the story of Zechariah. In fact, people of faith are the only kind of people that are going to be able to do God's work. Because it says in verse 10, back there again, For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. What do you think that means? The only ones that God's looking for are people of faith. People that have been tasked with doing incredible things. And maybe those incredible things are healing your marriage. That seems to be so totally broken it cannot be fixed. Getting your health under control. Finally stop eating the things that are killing you. Finally start being the kind of person that God wants you to be. I mean there's a plethora of things that we could compare to that are just as impossible in my personal life to achieve as it is in our spiritual life as a church to go out there and warn a lost and dying world that doesn't want to be warned. In fact, God is looking for people of faith. It's the only kind of people that are going to be able to finish the work. It's the only kind of way, faith, to save your own personal life. Is to be a person of faith, to to have God tell you something and then pick up a plumb line and start going to do it without saying, ah, yeah, I don't think that's going to work, Lord. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I've tried to talk to him over and over and, you know, he just doesn't want to listen. So I'm signing up for a divorce. I'm out of here. Or the school is just irreparably damaged and it cannot be fixed. So I'm taking my kids out and I'm going to put them somewhere else where they get a better education. We start thinking like Babylonians. It's the problem in Adventism. Because we're born and we're sown in Babylon. We're all Zerubbabel. But God's like, I need you to quit thinking like Zerubbabel. Like you're born in Babylon. And I need you as my people to have a day, a moment of small things. Pick up the plumb line and go. By faith, believe me when I say something. And act on it. God can and will help when we come to him in faith. But if we come to him as a Babylonian, your life is going to end up like Babylonians. In the beginning of this work, I I was reading in one of our, in this book I've been telling you a lot about, James White had some instruction from his wife, Ellen White. She had a vision that God says, look, we want you to, to start, God wants you to start this worldwide work in literature you're going to write a pamphlet and it's going to let me tell you what she said to james white from our books and papers bright beams of light are to shine forth to enlighten the world in regard to present truth 
She told him that God showed her that our publications would cover the entire face of the earth. James White didn't have a penny in his hand. He was no printing presses, no ink, no publishers. He had to scrape up the, the little change that he could find laying around the couch in his front room to get together some pen and paper and ink to write this little paper that was called the Sabbath the Sabbath Review and the Advent Herald. A little paper he put together. He walked all the way like 12 miles to the post office with this little paper in his hand. This first little copy. He got enough postage, sent it to. He, had, he made a few copies of it. I think it cost him something like 20 or 30 cents to make four or five copies. He mailed it out to like four or five Adventist families. And from that little act of faith. We know it today as the Review and Herald, and it is considered to be one of the finest publishing institutions held by a private citizen group in the world. Our publications literally cover the globe. And think about it, we cover the globe in a heartbeat with this eclipse thing happening. And just this quick, we're printing books with eclipses on the front and taking them to people that are interested in that kind of thing. It was an act of faith. If you read the story, he's like, I don't know how the Lord's going to do this. We're broke. We've got no money. We're eating radishes for dinner. I'm mowing hay to try to stay alive. But by faith, he grabbed the plumb line and went out. And God, look what God did with it. This is the story of Zechariah. Yes, Zechariah chapter 3. I've got a worldwide message that's got to get out to the world. You're my men in the myrtle trees, my women in the myrtle trees. You've got to go, but you're going to feel like there's no way that I can do it. My personal life, I'm too busy. I'm raising kids. I'm tired. I'm burnt out. I understand that. But God's like, I need you to, to grab the plumb line and get out there and act on, on faith. And why was men like James White? Why did Zerubbabel so like, okay, you say go do what? And the rest of them had been there for actually a while, like just building their own homes. They looked at the mess out there and the rubble and the debris and all the bricks and boulders laying over. Like, there's no way. Let's build our own house for a while. Pap, 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 pap. Let's do our own thing. But Zerubbabel, he had a different spirit in him. He was one that the spirit looked Scanning to and fro, saw a man of faith and chose him because Zechariah understood. Verse 6, so he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. He understood that. It doesn't matter. I told Mary this not long ago. Look, we need X amount, but it doesn't matter if it's $10 or $10 million. God provides all the same. He doesn't go, oh, there's the, he doesn't see the, the vast difference when we need something, if it's great or small. Zechariah, it didn't matter if God says, go build a, a horse barn or go build my city. It was by the might and power and spirit of God. It doesn't matter if you're asking God to help you get over a little argument with your wife or you're on the verge of a divorce. It doesn't matter if you don't understand how to raise your family or some small thing like that or you're on the verge of your whole family life falling to pieces. It doesn't matter what little thing. We can go to God with little things sometimes. Lord, help me pay my light bill. How about Lord, help me with the bigger things? It doesn't matter what it is. God is... He is like so far above our numbering system, which is Babylonian, by the way, right? All of our numbers are based on Babylonian equations from ancient Babylon. God's like, quit that. I don't go by numbers. In Babylon, 2 plus 2 equals 4. God's math, 2 plus 2, can equal whatever he wants it to equal. And it perfectly equate. <laughs> and so Zerubbabel has to learn to think a different way. And God, he is, becomes one of the great figures in the Second Temple period because he is setting a, a temple that must be built by faith because the man of faith is coming and a, and a movement of faith is going to come out of that. Now, as our story progresses, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Chapter 4 is based on faith. It's the great faith chapter. It's something that we need to understand. But chapter 3 is justification by faith. Chapter 4 is, is faith that has what? 
What does your faith have to ha- have to prove that your faith is actually true and real? All right, faith has to work by love. Faith has to work by love and purify the soul. There has to be evidence that my faith in what he's doing for me in an unseen realm called the heavens, before I can actually believe that and have a true faith, God says there needs to be a demonstration in your life that you believe me. So it's really interesting that God puts before us incredible things to achieve or to do or to be healed. These, these things that are so amazing that we got to go through sometimes. But if we go through them in faith, it's proof and evidence that I actually believe in the unseen. If I can't go through them on this earth, then it's proof that my faith is spurious. It's fake. It's not worth a dime because if I can't believe God, and he says this all the place, if you can't believe, if you can't love your brother whom you see, how can you love the Lord who you cannot see? All right, Jesus says this to Nicodemus, if you cannot believe things of the earth, how will you believe things in heaven? So faith is this way. If you cannot have a faith experience now in things of this earth, you will never have it when it matters in the judgment in things you can't see. And so chapter 4 is saying, hey, God is going to put something in front of you that is impossible But if you move forward, it's an evidence that that your faith in him is real. Go build. Zerubbabel picks it up. Got his toolbox on, and I don't know how, but God said go. And so in our lives, in this church life, this is what God is after. We are living in about the brokest church I've ever been. I've never seen a church this broke. Per capita of its people, never. I've never seen a, a church where we can't make budget. I've never seen a church where we can't get help with this many people. It's incredible. I'm not really beating up on you. I'm saying this is a problem everywhere. It's the times that we're living in. We're about the brokest, (laughs) poorest. I mean, we've got so many needs in this church. And how in the world is God going to use us to do the things we read about in Revelation 14 and Revelation 18? It seems impossible as a pastor. I just sometimes get discouraged and you want to give up. You're like, you know what? I understand why pastors make it about seven years and they leave. And let's get even more personal. How are we going to overcome sin? Live without an intercessor, sanctification, perfection, glorification. (laughs) Getting ready to be translated when we're still struggling with devotions once a day, prayer meetings. and all. I mean, it's really the same situation. How are we as a church and as individuals ever going to get to this next level if we're struggling so down here? Zechariah is the answer. It's going to be by faith, not by our efforts, because our efforts have proven what? Church can't do it. It's like the church needs it. We need to have a great big general conference session where all the churches get together and we all come before God and say, we cannot do it. 180 years we've been trying, and we cannot. That's what the church needs to come to its senses. We can't. But we believe by faith, you can. Help us, God. This is the faith that Zechariah had. That's why God chose him. He scanned all the earth and he looked for men that understood there's no way that they could do it. Not by might or by power, Damon Sneed, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Do I have real saving faith? It was the point of the midnight cry. The virgins, they all went to sleep. The best of them went to sleep with the foolishness. We're all asleep. The best of us are all asleep in a Babylonian dreamlike state. But the ones, that had, the ones that had the oil, symbol of the Holy Spirit, it was those that went on and went through. The ones that believed in the Spirit of God that, that He could do it. We cannot. We've yet to figure this out, I think. I believe that God has brought y'all all here for a purpose and for a reason. I mean, like, all y'all. You know when we say that in Texas what it means? All y'all means all y'all. There is something unique about all of y'all. 
And that is, there seems to be a common denominator. Of the, I, I see you coming in, and I'm like, oh, who's this new person? I don't even know that person. I don't even remember who they are. We're constantly getting all these new people in, but you all seem to have something that is similar to you all. And that is, I truly believe that y'all believe that you are God's people. I, I do feel that about y'all. That you come here for a reason. It's not because we have the best programs in the world. It's not because our sanctuary is the most pretty. But you're here, I believe, because you believe that God has called you. Now what I need you to understand is that you can't do it. I need you to know that. The scriptures are saying you can't, but if by faith you pick up the plumb line and say, okay, God, how are you going to do this? I don't know, but we're going to do this as a church. And if we will, verse 7 is clear what happens. <laughs> Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain and shall bring forth the capstone with shouts. Grace, grace. In other words, it'll be accomplished by what? Grace, not by your power. God's like, hey, you're going to go up to this mountain, Zerubbabel, and you are going to see it become a great plain. And it's going to be from you, you're going to be shouting grace and grace. This is what's going to happen with the Adventist church. When it finally all does go down one day, I really believe this. When it all goes down, God's people are going to be saying, grace, grace. There's no way. We tried it. We've seen it. We lived out the history of this church. I think in your own personal lives, when you see God bringing marriages back together, He sees you healing broken families. He sees a church coming alive. It will be because of God's grace that He was able to accomplish anything in any of us. But it's more, listen to this, it's much more than just having faith. Listen, here we go now. Now, Zechariah is starting to take us into the experience. It's much more than having faith saying, oh, I believe that you can do it, so I'm going to lead out and start trying to do it. Nominating committee's coming. <laughs> Did we announce the nominating committee names? Oh, no, we forgot to do that. Tess is going to get me. Some of you are on the nominating committee, and you are going to be like, uh-uh, I can't do that. There's no way. <laughs> I want you to remember the chapter. God's like, yes way. <laughs> yes, you can. With me, you can do it. I've called you. I picked you. I brought those poor seven souls together to hammer this out, and I put your name on their mind. It's much more than just be believing. Zerubbabel was going to tell us that God wants us to have an activation of faith. And here's how we activate it. Verse 7, again, back to 7. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. Have you read that anywhere else? There, that occurs in one other place in the Scripture, and I've never understood it. Think about it. Where else have you heard about a mountain being picked up and thrown away? Oh, man, Jesus is quoting Zechariah in Matthew chapter 17. Now, you know, I used to think this text was all about Okay, you can walk up to a mountain if you have a little bit of faith and say, be cast into the sea. And I just really struggle with that thought. But when you understand that Jesus is quoting Zechariah, oh man, it makes sense what he's saying. Matthew 17, verse 20 and 21. Well, let's just read verse 20 because then Jesus adds something to it. Verse 20, he says, So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you that if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved, and nothing will be impossible for you. And he's really quoting what Zechariah is telling Zerubbabel. That if you ask according to what God has called you to do, it's not like, okay, Lord, um, I need a new truck, so I believe really hard, and it's just going to appear. It's not what he's saying. He's quoting Zechariah. So if God has called you to do something, if he has put it in your heart, if he's promised it to you, then by faith, just a little bit of faith, because the work is God's, then he will, this mountain will jump and throw itself into a sea. It's hyperbole, but it's making a point. Has God called you to be at peace with your spouse? Is it God's will that you keep fighting with each other all the time? No. Does God want you to be healed in your relationships? Yes. So if he said yes, then by faith believe it, and he will. You will shout grace, grace. 
Quit trying to fix it yourself. I'm telling you, marriage counselors, psychology, is, oh, they got their place, but they're really woefully inadequate without the gospel. Do we need to raise money for this church? Do we need another church? Do we need a bigger church? Do we need more classrooms? Yes, we got a poor classroom over here that's just constantly crammed and people stepping all over them. And there's, we, we need room. We need money. This church needs millions. We need to fix it up. We need all kind of stuff. I hate even asking to, to get our carpet replaced. Because I know it'll take months and months and months to raise $50,000. Or is that a Babylonian mindset? Maybe I should go to God in faith and say, Lord. Now, what does Jesus add to the story, though? Did you read verse 21? Someone just say what, what you see in verse 21 of Matthew 17. What does God add to that? By what? You bet Jesus made sure we understood that faith has to be activated by prayer and fasting. And now we're getting to what I've been wanting to get to. Like all these great things that we're talking about, God's like the way that, that you will have this little bit of faith that will allow me to work in your life to do what I've already called you to do. The way to activate that faith is not just say, oh, I believe you're going to do it, Lord. But it is by actively praying and fasting for it. Now, where's Mark Williams? Mark knows this is the message. This is the ministry. And also, I think Larry has a ministry, too. And we have some women that have prayer ministry here. We have several prayer ministries going here. But if we really want to activate our faith, we have to show the way that you pick the plumb line up is not a real one, right? You don't go out into your husband's shed and get a real plumb line. Like, your plumb line is this. Okay, I'm hearing you, Lord. This is what you want from me and from my family, from my church and my personal life. The big mission of the Adventist church. The plumb line is to say, okay, Father in heaven, help me. What are your plans? What is your will? What is your way? What do you want from me? Of course, this requires a surrendered heart, a yielded heart, a death to self. The gospel has to be working. If it's working in your life. If you have a surrendered heart, a yielded heart, if you're coming to Christ, if you're living a repentant life, if you're coming to him and following him, then when you get on your knees, you say, okay, Lord, I know that this is what you're asking me to do. And you start praying and fasting, you're activating your faith, and you will be one of those that shout, grace, grace, bring forth the capstone. It's going to be happened. It's going to be built. It's going to be done. So, Della, if you want to fix the problems with the budget... Get on your knees and start praying. Rex, you need some help? Start praying. <laughs> Nominating committee? Oh, who's going to call so-and-so? They're like, oh, not me. I don't want to call because they're going to tell me no. Start praying, nominating committee. You don't know who you are yet, but we're already praying for you. <laughs> we want another church building. We want to grow. We want money. Church, start praying. Whatever division you are in this church and whatever your needs are in this church, get together in your little groups and start praying and fasting and saying, God, I know it's your will. If you know it's God's will, this is what I do with this church. I know it's God's will that it grows. And so I pray and I pray, God, send me new members. Send me new believers. Send us baptism. Send us transfers of membership. Send us like-minded people. Help us to grow so that we can be a praise of God in this part of the world and share the message with the lost and dying world. But it has to be by faith because, face it, I'm not some rock star guy. There is way better pastors, much better orators. There is people with better plans, much better men of execution than I will ever be. But I'm coming to it with faith. God, help us as a church. And when we do, God has promised in verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. How did he lay the foundation of the temple? He laid it by faith, didn't he? He laid it through prayer and fasting. As he laid the foundation, his hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. He's like, you're going to do this, Zerubbabel. And when you finish it, you're going to know that God has called you to do it, and it was by Him that you've done it. 
So whatever it is, if you set your hands, if a husband and wife can come together and come to God and lay that foundation in prayer and fasting, you're going to finish it. You're going to be back there some Sabbath day with your husband or your wife washing their feet in the couple's room with tears flowing out in your face saying, glory to God, he healed us. He can. It's up to you. We can see a thriving church, a thriving school. We can see our dreams as a church to witness and evangelize this part of the world if we will just pray and fast. If we lay the foundation in prayer and fasting, God has promised we will finish the work. (laughs) Wow. Finally, as we start to end this chapter... The prophetic narrative ends with a people that doesn't despise the day of small things, small beginnings. Actually, there's a reference to Haggai 2.3. Haggai is talking about this little small temple that you're looking at. It's small beginnings. The Son of God Himself is going to be in it. It's really, they're referencing the same idea of small things becoming big things. But it ends this way, that if we do not despise faith, if we lay our foundations in faith, if we pray, if we fast, if we go forward what God has called you to do, then you're going to find yourself looking at two olive trees. This is how it ends, verse 11 through 14. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that dip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes? from which the golden oil drains. Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. And, and, and I want to think about this in present truth reality, but just a word that will help you to understand. If we're talking in present truth terms, think the word, the phrase, latter rain. And now without going through another 20 minutes of a sermon, let me just boil it down from a, from a commentary It'll take about 30 seconds. Here's what these two olive trees represent. The mission of the two anointed ones is to communicate light and power to God's people. It is to receive blessings for us that they stand in God's presence. As the olive trees empty themselves into the golden pipes, so the heavenly messengers seek to communicate all that they receive from God. The whole heavenly treasure awaits our demand and reception. As we receive the blessing, we in our turn are to impart it. Thus, it is that the holy lamps are fed and the church becomes a light bearer to the world. It is a picture of the heavenly powers, the heavenly intelligences, the angels, the spirit, the workings of God. When he sees men and women of faith coming to him praying and fasting because they know that they cannot do it in their personal lives or in our church life. When God sees that as he scans to and fro the earth, he finds people that don't despise those small things of prayer and fasting. Then they find themselves being filled and lit up with the oil from these two anointed ones. A picture of all of heaven coming to your aid to help you in your marriage, in your home, in your church, in this work. That is powerful business. Oh, man. That's why I love the song, Faith is the Victory. Oh, wondrous victory that overcomes the world. I love it, man. So the story in Zechariah 4. It's the great work of the Holy Spirit, but through faith, but an activated faith that seeks God in pray and fasting. Do you want to try that from now on? Some hands, some raised hands, like, okay, I get it. I think I understand the message. Let's have prayer together. And as our, our team comes up to prepare us for our, our closing hymn, our Father in heaven, We recognize that we have been sown in Babylon. We have a way of thinking that is contrary to your paradoxical way of doing things. But as we, Lord, as a people, bow our heads in prayer, and maybe some fasting later on this week, as we do not despise this 
day of small things that's needed to do great big things in our personal lives, whatever that might be, in our church life, for sure we understand what that is. As we bow in prayer today, as our church groups gather in Sabbath school rooms, as they pray, as we begin to pray and seek you for the might and power to remove mountains in our lives, in our church life. Father, I pray that you would fill us with these anointed ones in all the power of heaven that you have promised to come upon us to heal us in our personal lives, whatever that is, and in our church life, I pray, God, that we would be healed and that as a people and as families, as husbands and wives, as parents, that we could also learn to cry out, grace, grace. Help us, God, we pray, in our great hour of need down here in a Babylonian world. Bless us that this chapter would take deep root and sink into our hearts that we may finally be the group of people that see it finished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.